In today's episode of Tank Talk, we're going to be talking about is breeding fish for profit profitable? But first, we have a few updates we're going to talk about, and I'm going to hand it over to John. How do you like that? Got a little different intro for us today. I like it. That was not planned. That was just decided out of nowhere. Hey, you do the intro today. Couple of updates. These are very, very cool. New product alert. I've been trying to figure out how to do a video about this, and I just don't know how to do a video about it, but we'll see. It's this, the brand new Fritz Master Test Kit or all of the individuals, which we haven't gotten those yet because we figured the master is going to be the way most people go. I am so excited about this. The people at Fritz have been talking to me about these test kits for what seems like a decade. It seems like it's been a long time. They've sent prototypes. Uh, they were here in February with prototypes. And it, it's been something when you're a major company like that, it, you it, there's a lot involved in coming up with a new product like this. But this one is cool. John, how is it different from the API master test kit that everybody knows about? Well, I'll tell you one big thing. I just opened up the box here, but one big thing might not mean a lot to y'all, but it means a lot to me. And I am so glad that they did this. There is one test for pH and one test only. You don't have a low range and a high range and all of that. It is wide range pH, which I love. I, I'm a big, big fan of that. The other thing, API might have this, but I don't know. Every single test has its own little book. And these are not big books, but it will have your chart in it. And it also has very cool tips for if your test shows this, you might want to do this gives you an idea of how to react to what the test is saying. I like that a lot. Comes oh, I in a, do too. Yeah, comes in a very convenient little box. I love it. I love everything about this. And uh, I say, well done, Fritz. This it is, is the test kit for dummies. It really is. I mean, and there's over 600 tests in one box. Wow. You got to love that. So and it's so colorful and pretty. Yep. It's I love very the packaging. Yep. Uh, of course you would love the packaging. It's very, very simple to use. Like Lisa said, it, anybody can do it. I understand the test strips are convenient and I am not somebody that is anti test strips, but this I'm, I'm just old school and the drops is something that I have always, it's just what I've always known. You get your vial, you put five mils of water in it, and you do your test. I don't know. It's my happy place. It's my comfort place. That's the way I've always done it. What's the code on it? Uh, this is a QR code. It says, for expert advice on the use of this product, scan the QR code. I can actually put that on the screen. That is so cool. If it'll focus. There you go. You can scan that code right now and get information uh, that's the cool thing about QR codes. You can do that kind of a thing. Uh, that is very neat. So yeah, big fan of this. It's been a long time coming. We have them on the site right now and uh, we will always have them because I, I am a fan of the API test kit. Okay. I'm not going to sit here and act like I, I'm not. I We used to carry it on our website, but there's a long story behind why we haven't had them recently. Uh, we don't have a bad relationship with API. It's nothing like that. It's just we can only get them from one distributor, and I don't particularly like to order from that one distributor. So uh, we've had trouble finding it anywhere else. Now we don't need to worry about it because we can buy direct from Fritz. We can buy from three different distributors that we deal with. It's easy for us to get Fritz. I have a great relationship with Fritz. They're a partner with us on the channel. We love Fritz. And so this is absolutely perfect that they would do this. Uh, and I could not be happier about it because it's been a long time coming. Mm -hmm. it, I see Sean Hale in person at least three times a year, usually four or five, because we'll run into him at, at other events. And uh, every single time I've seen him for the last three years, hey, when are we getting the test kits? Maybe not three years, but 
for a couple of years, I've just been all over him. And uh, I think he's kind of sick of answering that question. And he's happy that these are out because he doesn't have to answer that anymore. So I'm excited about it. Uh, I will showcase it in a video at some point. I just don't know how I'm going to do that. Um, it's not the most exciting thing to make a whole video about, even though I'm thrilled with it and excited. Um, I, I don't know how you do a video about a test kit. Maybe I'll figure it out and I we'll do that. The funny thing is um, the original, well, I don't want to say original, but there was some different packaging for that product back in February. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We had to be all secretive about it and all of this. It, it was, it was interesting. It was, it was a lot of fun. It was in one of the videos. Yeah, when we set the saltwater tank up, uh, it was in that video, and, and we did a little skit about it. It was fun. Yeah. Uh, good times. This has been a long time coming, and I am so glad to that not only it's available, but it's also something that we can have available for you. So really excited about that. Now, last update I do want to mention again, and I'm going to be mentioning it for the next few weeks until it actually happens. Aquashella, November 4th and 5th in Daytona Beach. I am going to be there. Very excited to be there. I'm going to be recording four or, excuse me, five podcasts while I'm there with guests like Coralfish 12G, Flip Aquatics, Primetime Aquatics, Jeff Miyake, Will Nace. Folks, it's going to be awesome. You're not going to see me doing that podcast because I'm doing it in my hotel room, but I'm also going to be filming four videos with you the people, the ticket holders, the peop the attendees of the show, I'm going to involve you in four videos that I'm doing. And I'm really excited about that. So make sure if you plan to go to Aquashella uh, in Daytona Beach, make sure you come and find me so you can be a part of one or all four of those videos. And if you're not going to Aquashella, well, you're doing the wrong thing. You need to go and you need to go there so that you can be a part of one of my videos that I'm well, going to be doing. Especially if you live in Florida. Well, yeah, if you live in Florida, you ain't got an excuse. If you live in Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, yeah, Arkansas is pretty close to Florida. I don't know. I don't know how far Arkansas is. <laughs> it's but, like saying, hey, you know, uh, if you live in uh, Oregon, there's no reason why you can't be there. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think... I could be wrong. I was absent the day they taught geography in high school, but uh, pretty sure Arkansas is closer to Florida than Oregon. Uh, you never know. A little bit, just a little well, bit. Well, you know, you but. might want to take the scenic route. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, very excited to see everybody there. Unfortunately, I will be going to that uh, event solo, leaving her here with our oldest son, who's going to come here and stand guard of the place while I'm gone. Um <laughs> But no, it's it's just going to be me. Sorry about that, but it's going to be a lot of fun. If you want to be a part of that, come to it. Not only because I'm going to be doing these videos, but also because it is the coolest aquarium festival on earth, period. You want to be a part of that. Tickets are cheap. Get the VIP. You go to, get to go to a dinner on Friday night. You get to get early bird. Come in, have donuts with us and coffee and all of that. It, just awesome. I, I have to say this. I didn't say it on last week's episode. I'm not doing a talk at this one. And that, and I'm okay with that. I'm glad. I actually told him I didn't want to. I want to take the show off. I want to take a break from that. And I want to do these videos instead. So it's going to be a good time. Come and see me out there and everybody else that's going to be there. It's going to be a blast. First time in Daytona Beach. So very excited. Now, main topic of today or for today. Uh, this was, you don't remember it, but this was your idea. Uh, okay. Brainstorming one night uh, and, you know, sending each other ideas, even though we were, you know, in the same house, probably in the next room, we're still texting each other ideas for uh, podcast topics. And it was you that said we should talk about uh is breeding for profit really profitable? And uh, I think I think we can come at this from a pretty unique angle because yeah. we've done it. <laughs> we've done it on a a big scale. I wouldn't say a huge scale, but we've done it on a relatively big scale. And uh, so we can we can tell you 
what was involved in setting that up, and whether we made any money doing it. Um, our breeding for profit journey started in 2010 in a little room on the interior of our house. Um, you know what? I'm getting ahead of myself because I just looked at my notes and I, I, I wanted to start this off a different way. So we'll get back to that little room in our house in a minute. When I was at Aquashella in, where was the last one we were just at? D Dallas? Was that mm -hmm. Dallas? Dallas, yeah. yeah. We were in Dallas the, earlier this year. I did a talk there that was not about this topic, but it was uh, basically telling our business story. And people that were there enjoyed it. I hated it because I don't like getting up there and talking about myself. But the first thing I did at that talk, and we had about, I was, it was like 47,000 people that were in the room watching me do at this least, talk. At least, at least, yes. Maybe 52,000, something like that. I it's, forget. It's hard to keep count. Yeah, I forget how many it was. But, yeah, I mean, it could have filled up Madison Square Garden. But, anyway, there was a lot of people there to watch my talk. And uh, the very first thing I did was I said, how many people in this audience right now, 52,000 people, how many people have ever thought about starting a business or, or any type of business that is associated with the aquarium hobby, show of hands, and I'm not kidding you. There were a lot of hands that went up. I am not kidding you. Of the 54,389 people that were in that room, 54,000 of them raised their hands. I'm joking. There was like 100 people in the room. But of those 100 people, I bet you 92 of them raised their hand. Yeah, I did not raise my hand. <laughs> Lady, this business was just as much your idea as it was mine. So don't, don't be playing that game with me. But everybody <laughs> raised, the, it was hard to find people that were not raising their hand. I think it's completely natural because with this hobby comes passion. Mm. We love this hobby. It takes over our life. We love watching these little boogers swim around and we love feeding them and we love making sure they're in a clean environment and setting up their tanks. And, and, it, and it just makes us feel good. And so naturally, anybody that's that passionate about something is going to want to do something to make it go even farther. We certainly did a couple of different ways we've done it. And, you know, it's been an absolute blessing for us. And, I, and we are not alone. And I was so glad because I was like, I'm sitting up there, you know, 54,000 people in the audience. I was like Dane Cook at Madison Square Garden. Uh, and I'm, I'm having nightmares like... What if I ask the audience this question and like four people raise their hand <laughs> reluctantly? I did. I felt very confident in what I was thinking. I, I it's as I've said it forever. I think we all, almost all of us, have these thoughts at one point or another. Now, sure, I I know people that uh, are not fish keepers that are very successful people, very wealthy. Uh, you know, they, they, they don't have aspirations of starting a business and becoming wealthy. They already are. And so to them, if they started the hobby, they probably wouldn't have that fantasy of maybe I can turn this into a big business. Um, but most of us regular people, I think we start to have this idea. Maybe we could start a business that's All around this. All it takes is that first fish to pop out babies, whether it's eggs, you know, that you find that your angels had laid, or if it's, you know, your guppies had babies, you know, your live bears start popping out fry, and, you know, you found the little quarries that had bred, and, you know, it's snails, they're, you found a clutch of snails, and now you have a bunch of mystery snails. All it takes is to find that first baby. It's so true. That's what it did for us. And it's like, oh, I can breed. Oh, oh I'm, I'm a professional fish breeder now. <laughs> and I can breed all these fish and I can sell them and I'm going to get rich. I'm going to make a lot of money. I'm going to start a fish store. Oh, my gosh. Where do I start? Let me figure out how to start a website. And you've been broke ever since we had that idea. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, we're not trying to cry the blues here, but that is 
that's how it happened. <laughs> I don't think you and I have ever aspired to be rich. I don't think we I said. I was exaggerating I about being rich. <laughs> we, I don't think that was ever really the motivation. But, you know, sure, everybody wants to make more money, don't they? I mean, that's, you know, anybody who says they don't care about how much money they make, they're lying to you. They do. I think but, people think they're, uh, and I say people because we are people, when you start breeding fish by accident, you're thinking, whoa, I'm really good at this. Well, you know what? No, the fish are good at it. Yep. <laughs> the fish are good at reproducing. So. Yeah. And I mean, that's how it happened with us. We'll get to that little room on the inside of our house uh, momentarily, but that's how it happened with us. Uh, it was a tank in my house that it was a 65 gallon tank that I had peacocks in it. Uh, I bought all males. A couple of them turned out to be juiced females. And then I was not trying to breed fish, but I was in there doing a water change one day. I had a piece of slate standing straight up in the back of the tank, not for any reason other than it looked cool. And when I moved that piece of slate, there was probably 40 free swimming fry behind that slate. And I said, oh, I immediately ran out to PetSmart or Petco. I don't remember which one it was, probably PetSmart. And I bought a 10-gallon starter kit, put it in my bedroom. I remember that. And I put the fry in there. And uh, and I told you, hey, you got to come over and see the babies. And Oh, my gosh. It was like the coolest thing in the world because that was the that was just so cool, that first batch. And it was like, oh, my gosh, I want to go see the baby fish. You know, I'd come <laughs> over, and that's the first thing I'd want to do is go see the, the baby fish. And, yes, I knew she was going to love those baby fish. Yes, I did put them in my bedroom on purpose. No, I didn't. <laughs> I lived terrible. <laughs> I lived in a house that was about the size of this room. It was a very, I loved that house. I, had, I really adorable. did. I loved living in that house. It was very small. And, uh, and it was really the only place I could put a, a tank was in my bedroom. So it was in there. And we would, not trying to be funny here, but we would spend a lot of time in that bedroom, sitting on the foot of my bed, staring at that staring tank. Staring at the fish. And just talking. And, and that's when the idea for KG Tropicals happened was, you know, hey, we did a really good job of this by accident. What if we did this on purpose? Oh, my gosh. And that's when the whole roller coaster ride began. Um, we were not living together at the time. Uh, I think that was pretty obvious by me calling her saying, you got to come over here and see these babies. Uh, but we did soon after merge our households. And we found a really cool house, which still you say is your favorite house that, that we've ever lived in. I love that house. Even more than the house we have now, which hurts my feelings. But I, I, every single time she says that, I still say, well, you picked this house. I didn't pick this one. Well, we had a huge pond in the backyard, too. Giant. That's so true. You remember? You know how many fish we could have put in that? But anyway, but anyway, it was a natural pond, and it, it was it was nice. Only half of it was on our property, though. That the other half weird. was on the other neighbor. But it was probably it was probably 60 feet long. And 40 feet wide. It was it was a really big Can pond. Can you imagine if we stuck fish in there and we put it in there because, you know, we're like, oh, we have a pond. We have all these fish. There are fish. They're on the other side of the pond and they're like fishing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, and that, you know, it wouldn't have surprised me. Um, we never even knew those neighbors. But anyway, we were just renting that house. We were there temporarily. But it was a great house. It was. That's where we started our business. That is where KG Tropicals was born. That's where we became certified master breeders. <laughs> I don't even know how you get that certification. We were not that, but we bred a lot of fish there. We bred enough fish to become certified master breeders. Yeah, we should have been. I mean, we, we should have been master African cichlid breeders because we were pumping them out. We were pumping them out fast. But it started, well, first of all, the concept started with that um, accidental... I had bred African cichlids way back in the day, but I didn't mean to this time. And when I when this happened and I have a significant other who also loves fish, that's when the ideas start turning. And that's when we came up with the idea of doing it on purpose. And we started it in a little teeny room. And the best way to describe it is this room was like a lobby in the basement. 
and other bedrooms were off of this little lobby. So it's like you have this hallway that goes into a little open room and there's doors in that open room that go to the bedrooms. And that was the room where we decided right. to set up our first fish room. It was probably eight feet by eight feet. It was tiny. and But that's where we started it. We knew we were going to move it out into the garage because it had a three car heated, beautiful garage. Right. And we knew that's where it was going to end up, but we were just starting out. So we started it up in that center little room there, which was horrible because the kids had to walk through that room to get to their bedrooms and stuff. They never complained. They were fine with it. And, um, and yeah, we, and, but we were only in that little room for six or seven months, probably, until yeah, we started moving that. it. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, we moved into the house. We immediately started. And, and we made this decision before we even rented the house. Like, we saw it, and we were like, look at the garage. We could start our business in there. We had KG Tropicals listed yeah. with the county already uh -huh. registered. We had the email, yep. everything. We had all of it. And so we were like, that could be where we put KG Tropicals. So we picked that house for one, it could accommodate five kids and us. And for two, it was perfect for starting our business. <laughs> so, I still think back on that and it's like, wow, we were crazy. <laughs> we were so crazy about baby fish. Yep, we really were. And But we had to start it somewhere. Our garage was still full of all of our junk when you got five kids, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so we couldn't put it in the garage right away. We put it in that little room. We had, I want to say it was like 24 or 27 tanks in that little room. I built a rack where I could turn the tanks sideways, 10-gallon tanks all the way across, and then going across the bottom, and then a middle row of either 20s or 29s. I mean, I got as many tanks in that room as could possibly be gotten so in that room. I am so sad that we didn't get, like, video footage. You know, like, more, you know, we didn't show it more. Because YouTube didn't really become a thing for KG Tropicals until the garage was set up. Right. There, There is only one video that I have of that. And I showed it in my talk at Aquashella. Oh, uh, our oldest daughter caught me singing to the fish. Right. I was feeding the fish and I was singing them cute little songs while I was walking through the room, a lot skinnier than I am now, uh, and no gray. But, and I, I'm singing and she caught it on video and uh, posted it. It's on YouTube as we speak. Yeah, that's so I just, funny. I don't have a link to it. I think it's got like 60 views or something like that. It's adorable, but that's the only footage we have of that room. Um, we made the best of that room for the very short time that we were in there. But when things really expanded was when we went out into that garage, three car garage. So it was like 20 by 36, something like that. Really big garage. And we kept some fish in that garage that we only had in the garage that didn't go to the fish store with us. But I'm bringing those back. They're going to be in my tank. We brought them to the fish store. Yeah, they were, they ended up going in the 240. I don't remember that. For some reason, I thought we got rid of the tank and those fish. No, the tank went with us. I I It was right across from the sales counter on the end of one of the racks. Okay. And yeah, I mean... It was the 75-gallon tank. I don't want to give too many hints because I don't want people to figure it out. But, yeah. yeah, I did a video all about those fish, and and you're absolutely right. You're going to be bringing them back in a big way. Yes. It's going to become one of the most popular fish in the hobby because she did that with discus. She did that with female betas. I, She's going to make I'm not, these. I'm not taking credit for all that. <laughs> Wasn't a whole lot of talk about female betas until you started doing it. But anyway. I, mean, I saw videos about it. Uh, we we moved out into the garage six or seven months after we started it up in that little room. We were breeding probably seven or eight different types of fish in that little room. Peacocks oh, yeah. and bunas. We it was did, just peacocks at that point. No, because I had yellow labs in there because I remember I, I killed a whole tank of yellow labs with uh, algae fix. What? I... I had a 
an immense brain fart, biggest brain fart anybody's ever had, and put a, a dose of algae fix in a tank with yellow lab fry and killed them all. Oh, I don't remember that. For some reason, I thought it was just the the peacocks because we had we started off with the sunshine yellow bangas, the sulfur heads, the German reds, uh, the regal yellow blue. Blaze. Regal Blues, yeah, and the Yellow Blaze Haps. Was it Yellow Blaze? I thought they were later. Like, we didn't, I thought it was only Peacocks. I don't know. We didn't do any big haps out there. We didn't do big haps until we got out to into the garage. the garage. And I was so excited when I got my Lethronop Intermedius. I was yep. like, oh, I love those. They're my favorite. And then what other haps did we have? We had Venusis. Um, anyway. We moved out into that garage and went nuts. <laughs> oh, my gosh. We were constantly looking for where we could get breeders from to, to have all of it. We wanted it all. We wanted every single African cichlid you could possibly get your hands on from Lake Malawi. Yep. I think the total number, I think we bred 29 different types of fish in that garage but only successfully bred 27 i want to say because we never successfully bred the venustus we got them we got females holding but we never got any vi uh, viable fry out of that and, and the other ones that we do not speak of yeah we're they're like voldemort we we do not say their name uh not because we don't like them but because uh they're coming <laughs> but uh but yeah, 29, we only successfully bred 27. Um, when we moved out into that, that garage and we had all that space for activities, we started gathering up tanks from everywhere. Uh, Facebook, well, Facebook, Facebook Marketplace wasn't a thing. It was Craigslist for It was me. Craigslist. I was obsessed. You were. It was crazy. And it was, I'd, be get, I'd get home from work and she'd be like, we got to go to this place because we're going to buy a... 75 gallon tank, complete setup. I had us driving to Northern Virginia, Richmond, everywhere, Tennessee. Well, yeah, that came later when we had the shop. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but for the for the garage, it was Craigslist, and then it was Maru Pets that shut down. Oh yeah. I went to a store in uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia, that was Born shutting down. Work. Yeah. It was advertised in Facebook that or or Craig, Craigslist that they were selling all of their tanks. And it's funny because he had a listing up and I knew that's what it was. Like, I didn't know that store was closing, but when I saw the ad, I was like, Oh, that's Maru pets. First of all, damn, they're, sh they're shutting down. That sucks. But then I'm like, well, Hey, I can go there and I can get a bunch of tanks from there. The guy totally ripped me off, but I bought a whole bunch of 20, longs. 20 no 33 longs. Oh yeah. 33. The ones that are 48 inches, 48 by 12 by 12. Those were nice. One of my favorite tanks. Um, I bought a bunch of 15s from him, a bunch of 55s I bought from him, and they were all pre-drilled. They all had the, um, like the permanent back color. I don't know. Dark, dark blue. And it green. Was really, the, the blue was really nice. I think it was the steam fop blue. It was almost like the blue of your Aquariums Unlimited Reptiles Unlimited shirt yeah. there. That you're wearing so gloriously. My favorite fish store in the world. Why don't you show them the back? You want oh, to turn around and show them back? the back? We were just given these by Mark uh, last weekend. Well, your hair is kind of covering it up. <laughs> there you go. Yep. Yeah, let me tell you what this broad sitting across from the table said that day. I we tried. were there. She tried to get me to walk out with a sulcata. I wanted it. But... I I decided I'm not prepared yet, so I will not get it yet. I wasn't, I, I didn't do that thing, you know, where it's like, I want it, I must have it, and I walked out with it. I waited. You were a good girl. I was. Yep. It's coming next week, though. It's going to be delivered. Just kidding. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> and Mark was like, yeah, you should buy it. They're great. Anyway. No, he said, oh, maybe a Christmas present. Oh, God. We're like, no. <laughs> you've, you've spoiled us enough already, Mark. <laughs> Uh, but 
Yeah, Maru Pets, they shut down. I went in there, bought a whole bunch of tanks from them, and that was nice because I was able to get, they're all the same size. Uh, they had the really nice backgrounds on them, um, and, and I got them all in one place, one big chunk. I think I probably bought 30 tanks from him mm-hmm. all at, at one time. Um, when you watch our old videos, like the first three videos on our channel, any of the tanks that you see that have that blue background or the green background those came from that store mostly the 33 longs and then a bunch of 55s and a bunch of 15s um so that was great and then we had the 240 which was the same two uh the same footprint as this except a foot less deep it was eight by two by two where this is eight by three by two um and that that 240 was in a whole lot of videos on our youtube channel uh, we had a 150, a 125, which is still sitting right there. We had a whole bunch of big tanks. We had 75 gallons, 55 gallons, and 29 gallons that were our breeder tanks. And then everything else was fry tanks. The 240, we, the funny thing about that is it was, wasn't it advertised as a 125? A 150, yeah. Yeah. And we get down there and you're like, ooh. <laughs> Yep. Ooh, you were so excited. You're like, this is not a 150. I remember you looking at me and going, this isn't a 150. You were so excited. And I was kept keeping it quiet. Like, we don't want this guy to really know. Because I think I paid 150 bucks for it. Oh, yeah. It was- for, a, for a 240. It was gnarly. It was beat up. It leaked. It was scratched up. You it was not. To do with it. Uh-huh. It was not a pretty tank. Uh, there was no stand or anything like that. It was just a glass box with a broken frame. But I got so much joy out of that tank, and I paid, I think, 150 bucks for it. So you can't lose there. But And it ended up being a main staple point yeah. right in the front of the store, too. Well, I mean, it was just like this tank. Like, this tank shows up in almost every single one of our videos when we're in the fish house. It was the same way with that tank, whether it was in the garage or in the shop. Yes, it was the very first thing people saw when they walked into the shop. Uh, so yeah, we got a lot of miles out of that tank. It was great, but 127 tanks in total is what we ended up with in that garage. Uh, everything from 10 gallon fry tanks all the way up to that 240. The really big tanks, the 240, the the 150, and the two 125s, those were our tanks. Those had our pets in them, uh, but everything else was for breeding, and. Even though I bought a lot of those tanks off of that guy from the store that was shutting down and we got a lot of really good deals on Craigslist, um, we put a lot of money oh, into yeah. that garage. And so there's a, there's a reason why I'm telling this story when we're talking about is breeding for profit really profitable. I don't know. I never... I've never been a very smart businessman. I don't know how much money we spent to set that garage up. But if it was under $20,000, I would be shocked. I mean, it it had to be. It wasn't all at one time. It took us like two years to get it where it was completely done. And then we moved it to the shop. And that's including buying the fish to breed, you know, the breeders and all that. We spent... We put a lot of money into that alone. Yep. I mean, the blower that we used to run the sponge filters in the whole place was really expensive. Uh, One male African cichlid costs a lot more than what people would think, you know, so that has a lot to do with cost. Well, yeah, because we were buying mature breeding size males and they'd be 70, 80 bucks for one fish for the male. Buying it as a business expense, it makes total sense. This fish is old enough to breed right away, so this fish can start producing for us right away, and you know we can sell them for good money and, and make our money back. It's well worth the cost, and I would usually buy two males and eight females, and I would only put one male in. Uh, we had our most success. This is not a How to Breed African Cichlids podcast, but I would put one male in with the females and if he didn't produce quick i would pull him out and put the other one in and that worked i mean we didn't do that with the imbunas but we did that with all of the peacocks Mm -hmm. so yeah you know you're talking about 
to buy breeding age females, which <laughs> Live Fish Direct, we bought a lot of them from them. They loved us because we bought females. Oh, yeah. <laughs> females are hard to get rid of in the African cichlid world. And we bought a lot of them. And then to speed it up even quicker so that, I mean, because at first we were doing the holding mamas would each go in their tank until they spit their fire out, which was super fun to watch. And I really missed that. I enjoyed that a lot. But once we started doing it for profit, once we knew we needed to speed it up so that we could make money quicker, we, that's when we started doing the tumblers. Yep. Yep. And that, that did work really well. And I'm going to oh. tell, tell a little story about that. It'll make, it would make you very sad. Uh, but if you ever want to see this in action, uh, I can tell you the video to watch. Uh, it makes me very sad to watch it too. But anyway, uh, because of two animals that appear in this video, we had a routine every week with that garage. We would do water changes on Sundays. And water changes induce spawning with Africans. They just do. And so inevitably, when we got home from work on Monday, we would have a bunch of holding females. And the oh, fun yeah. thing to do would be to go out into that garage and you would walk around. And mm -hmm. sometimes you would do this before I got home from work and you would text me. There's eight, eight mamas. She would call them mamas. <laughs> um but walking through there, going to all of the breeding tanks, and you would be yelling out, oh, we have a yellow lab mama. There's a German red mama. There's a regal blue mama. And it was so much fun. It was. There's a video on our channel of my golden retriever that we lost in 2017. Very, very sad. Um, she is like trying to bite an imbuna that's in one of the bottom tanks. <laughs> and it's adorable. It was. I got it on film. Ethel shows up in that video right. too. Uh, so my two dogs, which have both left us, um, are in that video. And you can hear you very faintly in the background saying, oh, there's a blah, 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 mama. And there's a <laughs> mama, mama. It's so, so cute. Uh, the video on our channel is Golden Retriever versus White Top Afra. That's the title of the video. I didn't know how to title videos back then. It's only like two minutes. It's really cute, but you can hear her in the background uh, doing that. It was a lot of fun, and, and that was a weekly routine for us. Um, but at the end of the day, was this something that made us money? You have to factor in what it cost to put it all together. Now, if, I'm, I'm not going to include facility as part of the cost because – you might have a basement and that's what you're going to start breeding in uh, or a garage like we did. If you're somebody that's going to build an independent structure to start your breeding operation, first of all, I'm going to tell you, you've lost your mind. Unless you're breeding like super rare discus or, you know, you're breeding something that you're going to sell these fry for hundreds of dollars a piece. I'm going to tell you you're crazy if you do that, mainly because... It's going to take so many fish sold to get your money back on that. Oh, yeah. And you may be like we were at the time, not realizing how many of those fish have to be sold before you get that money back. Oh, yeah. I, I can be completely honest with you right now. In the two years that we were in our garage, I can promise you this. We did not make our money back for setting up that garage. We did not make $20,000 in those two years. No. And I don't know if it was exactly $20,000. And, and a lot of the tanks that we had were bought over several years. Uh, a lot of it was bought after we moved out into the garage. But we had been accumulating things for a long time. We, went, we bought things as cheap as we possibly could. Almost nothing that we put in that garage was brand new. We... we we were penny pinching as good as we could. And I promise you, we still spent $20,000 and we had, there was not an empty tank in the entire garage. Every tank had either breeders or fry in it. Most of them had fry in it. We would start them out when they were first born. Uh, we would start them out in 10 gallon tanks. 
then we would move them up either to 33s or 55s to grow them out. And the 55s are what we would sell them out of. I mean, we had a whole process in and, there. And, you know, thinking back on that, we didn't have any kind of hospital tank or anything. We stuck with a routine. We kept our water clean and we never got sick fish. Nope. Do you we remember? Never did. I mean, everything was healthy. It was just, it was awesome. I mean, we were very lucky too. We we did uh, the work. Oh yeah, yeah. We and did we the work got and from good pla a good place too. So definitely, I mean, I cannot recommend uh, Life Fish Direct more. I, I love those people over there. I love their product. It's amazing. Um, you don't hear much about them anymore, but they're still doing their thing and they're great at it. Um, and I'll never forget when our channel passed their channel on YouTube. And I was like, woohoo, 551 subscribers. And we passed <laughs> them. I was, it was like a huge celebratory thing because they were a huge motivation for why I started our YouTube channel. But anyway, we're getting so far off track. You're, you're absolutely right. We, we very rarely had any issues out there. Sometimes we would deal with a little bit of aggression issues, but sick fish what's that yeah, like we, we never dealt with that yeah we didn't use chemicals or anything we just we hadn't as far as treating a sick fish we didn't use chemicals so because we didn't have to yeah. i mean we we kept the water clean we were absolutely like it Very was a regiment yeah. it was every single week we were doing our thing and uh it was a lot of work but it was it was worth it the fish were breeding like crazy um and but but i i promise you we did not make $20,000 out of that garage. We didn't. And I think one of the hardest parts, too, is you get this idea in your head, oh, I'm going to breed these fish, you know, I'm going to make money off of breeding these fish. But I will never forget the first time we had somebody buy fish that we bred. And I'm like, oh, well, we got to let them go now. Like, <laughs> but I raised them from babies. Yep. I can't sell them. But that was the whole point. Yep. <laughs> and you learn real quick to get over that. But yeah, it was that was tough. The first few, the first few sales. I'm pretty sure the very first customer that we ever had in our garage was the Lewises. I'm pretty I think sure. So too. Uh, wh who we became very good friends with yeah. as we as we continued on. Um, he had a great fish room in his basement in King George. Um, they were the first people that came to our house and bought fish. We started the website, sold a lot of fish on our website. And I, I, I'm just going to tell you, we, I don't know the numbers because this was so long ago. But um, when I say we didn't make $20,000, I mean profit $20,000. I, I don't think we did uh, because of all of the little hidden expenses and all of the things that mm -hmm. cost money that you don't think about when you're having this dream of starting a fish business, we didn't think about it. And real, I don't think really anybody does. I mean, smart business people do. We are not those people. <laughs> fish food and water conditioner gets expensive for a hundred and something tank. <laughs> and not to mention heating the room, oh, the yes. water bill. I mean, everything. The electric bill. Everything yeah. goes up. Uh, and, you know, we're not looking for sympathy here. You asked for this and, and you knew that that was going to be part of the expense. If we had been paying rent for a building oh. just to do this out of, I mean, that would have been nuts. And that's why I said, if you're going to build a structure to breed fish, you're, you're crazy. You should absolutely try your hardest to have them somewhere that you're already paying for or, you know, is free, your mom's basement, whatever it is, do that before you start spending money to, to breed. Uh, if you really wanted to do that, I would tell you just sell fish. Don't breed them. Just sell fish. If you're going to rent know. a place. I Well, yeah, if you're going to rent a place, but something though, that I think is super important is that people know that, Getting fish from a hobbyist that bred them themselves is such a, an, just, they're better. I mean, that I, I'm stumbling on my words because I, I'm trying to explain that, you know, you're going to get a better fish 
in my opinion, if their hobby is spread. So if you are somebody who's crazy and you want to breed fish for profit, but you're not looking to make a lot of profit, then I think you're great. I think this is exactly, you're the person that we need in the hobby because fish that are bred at home and not imported, they have less stress. Yep. They haven't had to go through all that shipping. You know, they, they haven't had to be put into a bag multiple times to get to their forever home. You know, if you're somebody who is doing it for profit, you're selling it at your club or you're selling them um, super cheap to your local fish store or something or on whatever eBay or whatever, then, you know, these fish are going to be a lot more, um, they're going to be stronger, they're going to be healthier. They're gonna, I think, in my opinion, they're going to last longer. So. Well, and there's also the fact that they most likely have not been raised in fry tanks. Right. They've been raised in just the people's aquariums. When you're when you're doing this as a business, you're going to have breeding tanks. You're going to have fry tanks. And you know, farms use ponds. They don't use fry tank. Maybe the fry go into little tanks, but then they graduate up to ponds. But uh, you know, they have huge vats that they raise these fish in you you have to have big numbers if you're selling fish but if you're a hobbyist that's breeding and selling at your club and stuff like that the fry were probably raised with the parents just in a regular aquarium that they're taking care of not a fry tank with a thousand other fry having to fight for every morsel of food and all of that so there's that along with the fact that they haven't been shipped all over the world you can get a lot of really good fish from farms and importers and stuff like that but it is true that it's a different it's a different deal you're you're getting a different product than you would be if you were buying from somebody who is a for-profit breeder that's but, just a fact but i guess what i'm trying to say is you can be a for-profit breeder and a hobbyist at the same time and still be doing it out of your garage but be considered the same does that make sense yeah, I mean, what I the only thing I would say to that is you're, you're probably not going to make any serious money. Make a few dollars doing that. But we need but, these people in the hobby. Oh, I just I don't disagree at all. We we need them and they're great. Um, but I you know, you're going to be hard pressed to pay the bills. Right. If you're breeding out of a garage, I'm sure there's some people that have done it breeding, you know, crazy discus and stuff like that, but uh, to be able to sustain a household and pay all of the expenses of a family out of a garage oh, is not going to be easy. You need to keep your full-time job. <laughs> Which you, we did. Yeah, you need to keep your full-time job. Do the whole breeding for profit thing, yeah, you know, but don't expect it to pay your bills and, you know, your mortgage. Just kind of don't expect that. <laughs> <laughs> it can turn into that. I mean, it, it absolutely can. And yeah, we, if you live in Florida. Well, that helps. We, <laughs> we know multiple different people that own farms that are very successful and have been successful for 30, 40 years. And where do they uh, live? They live in Homestead, Florida, which right. is a tropical place that, <laughs> you know, you can do these things in vats outdoors. And then a uh, hurricane comes through and wipes them all out. But anyway... Uh, which has happened to both of those people that we know down in Homestead. Um, but that's that's the thing. You know, I, I would want to set your expectations properly. If you're looking to make a living out of your garage breeding fish, I'm telling you it's going to be very difficult to do. Uh, there are fish you might be able to do it with, but to make real money selling fish, you have to sell a lot of them. And the problem is, if you start a business like we did out of our garage and you start a website, how many fish are you really going to be selling out of your garage? And can you breed those fish fast enough? Can you produce enough fry mm -hmm. to sell them? And then when those sell, you've got more coming up. And it's a whole process. In order to make serious money, I'm not saying you can't make any money. I'm not saying you can't profit. But to make serious money, you know, what's serious money in 2023? 100000 a year? You're not going to make $100,000 a year selling breeding fish 
and selling them out of your garage. I'm sorry, prove me wrong. I'm not saying you can't make $100,000 a year selling fish. You probably could. Buying from a wholesaler, bringing them in, selling them, constant flow in and out, in and out, in and out. You could do that and you could probably make $100,000. But you have to think about in a two-car garage or a three-car garage, you only have so many tanks. And right. if those tanks are full of fish that are, are full of fry, they you need, can't sell anything out of there. Exactly. They need to grow out. And fish take a while to grow out, especially if you're talking about rainbow fish. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of fish <laughs> that, that take a long time to get to sellable size. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, you're, you're bre you're, you have these fish that are growing up. They're in that tank and they're only, you know, a half of an inch long. You can't sell them. And they might be in there for six months before you can sell them. And, and so you run out really of tanks. Is it worth it at that point? That fish that you were waiting for it to grow up, you, you just dedicated uh, an aquarium to a fish that you're going to probably make $70 off of. But that's a long time to wait for that $70. Yeah, you wait six months to, yeah. to make 70 Yeah, you're right. Because uh, there's a lot of fish that, you know, you'll be selling for very cheap. You know, you might be selling them a dollar a piece or something like that. I mean, if you have 70 fish in there and you sell them for a dollar a piece, was that tank being occupied for six months to make $70? Was that worth it? How many of those tanks do you need to have so that if you're selling each one for $70, you're making enough money to sustain a, a lifestyle? The answer is a lot, a whole lot. This is why farms have massive ponds. They have those vats that are like, I, I don't know how many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gallons are in each one. And they have five acres of them. You know, Florida Exotic Fish Sales, they have, they have a five acre farm, which is the size of our entire property, which is a really good size. And it's full of ponds and vats. That's the scale that you need to be at where you're, you're actually making some serious money. I, I don't know how much money Florida Exotic makes, but they've been doing it for a long time. So I would imagine they're doing pretty well. I don't think, I don't think they're rich, but I think they're doing well for themselves. But that's the scale that you have to be at before you're, you're making good money. The flip side of that, if you have your two-car garage and you have that 55-gallon tank that you grew up those 70 fry in, if instead you bought fish from a farm and you put 70 fish in there that you paid a, you paid a dollar a piece for, but you can sell them for $3 a piece, you bring them in, you immediately sell them for $3 a piece, and then what can you do? You can buy them again, fill it up again, and sell them for $3 a piece. You don't have one cycle of six months to raise those fry to sell for $70. You bring those fish in, you sell them all within a maybe a month, bring in another batch, sell them in a month, bring in another batch. Now you've made $700 from that tank in six months. You're doing a whole lot better. I know my math doesn't make sense, but I hope the concept makes more sense. Bring fish in, pay wholesale, sell retail. You're making a whole lot more money per fish because what a lot of breeders end up doing is realizing they can't keep going if all they're doing is selling direct to consumers. That's why a lot of farms don't do it. Instead, they sell their fish wholesale to stores, to, mm. to retailers all over. And so now instead of sending them, you know, a dozen angels for $10 a piece, you're selling them a, do a dozen angels for $1.50 a piece. But you're getting rid of a dozen fish. You're getting rid of 60 fish at a time. So the volume makes up for the lack of money for each individual fish. I hope all of this is making sense. But this is why you don't come across. I've, I've never met somebody that makes a living breeding fish and selling those fish out of their two-car garage. I've never met that person. I'm not saying that person doesn't exist, but I've never met that person. Is it impossible to do? No, but it just doesn't make sense that that's something that can really be done. So the answer to the question, can you profit breeding fish? 
Of course you can. You have to do it at a scale, though, that is probably a lot bigger than you think. Um, and is it a good business to be in? Yeah. I mean, we love fish, don't we? <laughs> Who wouldn't love to be doing this? And, and here's the thing. I don't know, and we've met a lot of them, I don't know a farm owner that hates their job. No. People who breed fish and they do it for a living, they all love their job. Why? Because at the end of the day, they're, they're doing their hobby for a living. So you don't have to be rich to be happy. And I mean, we've been to Leif de Mason's house. He has a very nice house on a very nice piece of land that is where his farm is. And, and Leif is doing well for himself. But that's the old, that's the owner of Old World Exotic Fish Sales. That's a major farm that ships to, to people all over the country. If you want to, and, and Leif does well for himself, and he should. He's a legend in this, in this hobby. The DeMason I Cichlid is named after him. Uh, you have to be at that scale to be at that level to where you're like making good money. Um, but what I've found is a lot of people that we've met that aren't making a lot of money, but they're doing okay and they're breeding fish. So that makes it okay with them. Yeah. You know, Hey, if you're doing what you love, the old saying, if you do what you love for a living, you don't work a day in your life. It's true. Um, and, and there's another thing that I do know. I know a couple guys that are up there in years. And when I say up there in years, I mean like in their seventies, still out on the farm every day working. I'm talking fish farmers. So if there's one thing that could be said, if you farm fish for a living, you're going to live a long time. <laughs> wow. And it's probably because you're busting your ass. You're not sitting at a desk all day like I do. You're out there putting in work. And you're going to live a long time. But no, I'm just being silly. I do know a couple of older guys that have been doing this for a very long time. So maybe it is the, uh, the magic elixir for long-term life is breeding fish. But yes, you can make money breeding fish. Um, if you really look at it, you're probably not going to make as much as you think unless you're breeding some kind of wild exotic fish. Um, but you'll have a lot of fun doing it. And if you can make enough money to sustain what you're doing and you love doing what you're doing, you're gold. You won. And, and that's really all that matters, right? Yeah. All right. Well, let's just stop messing around. Let's get right into it with Lisa's World. Oh, she has to pee. Well, go ahead. All right. So just I'll just figure out a way to edit it just... We'll go back to me and we'll say, all right, now it's time to do Lisa's World. Well, today I want to do a shout out to University of Mount Olive's field hockey team because that is the team that my daughter plays for. They are Division II in the NFHCA and they are ranking number six in the nation right now. They have 30, no. 21 consecutive wins, and that's over a three-year span. And they are currently number two in the country for goals and assists. And let me look. in their scoring average. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to do a shout-out to them. This is my daughter's senior year, so um, I've been going to all the home games. I haven't been able to go to away games because, well – you know, the travel to other states and stuff. It's a little time consuming and we have a business to run and I have all these cats that I've rescued and, and a very needy hus husband. Well, and you know, there's the fish house. There's just a lot. There's a whole lot. And I am also a grandmother. So I, I have other kids and grandkids. So it's not like I can go to every single game. I try to, but I can't go to every single one of them. Uh, but anyways, I just want to do a special shout out to them and the team because those girls are doing amazing and I'm so proud of them. And the coach, he's an awesome guy too. Um, let's see. I think that's it. 
You know what? I just realized we skipped comment of the week this week. Did you have a good one? Because we can do that last. I do have a comment of the week. Okay. Well, let me do John's World first, and then and then we'll do that. John's World! Because I, I enjoy pissing people off. Oh, great. When so we, we're not going to get to comment of the week because everybody <laughs> will be gone. When I do John's World, uh, sometimes I... I use that as an opportunity to piss people off. Oh. Um, but if you are somebody, if you get pissed about what I'm about to say, then there's really only one group of people that you should be pissed at. And if you're not, then I don't understand you. And we probably couldn't be friends. Um, this is a story you probably don't even know about. I've told you about it, but there's been new uh, information put out about it that uh, just really infuriates me. Oh. Uh, anybody that knows me knows I am a massive baseball fan, more particularly a Washington Nationals fan. And uh, there was a free agent a couple of years ago that had just come off winning a Cy Young Award. And I hoped so bad that the Nationals were going to pick him up because I'm a huge fan of this guy, not only as a pitcher, but also, he has a YouTube channel, and I watch his YouTube channel all the time, and I, I love the way he is, the person that he is. Even though a lot of people can't stand his personality, I happen to like it, because he knows people don't like his personality, and he just kind of feeds that, and I just think that's cool. Talking about Trevor Bauer, uh, this is a guy that I desperately wanted the Nationals to pick up, uh, but he didn't go to the Nationals. He went and signed the biggest contract in the history of Major League Baseball for a pitcher uh, with the Los Angeles Dodgers. And I don't blame him because, I mean, who wouldn't have done that? Uh, however, not long into his time with the Dodgers, um, he got into some trouble. And this is what I've told you about, and I've told you, uh, she's not even looking at me anymore. That's how ashamed she is of me, what I'm talking about right now. I was telling you even back then that I knew this story was crap. I knew it was not true. I knew that this guy was getting railroaded, and uh, and 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 I turned out to be right. But uh, if you don't know the story, a couple of years ago, uh, a young lady accused him of things that are inappropriate, which you can't even say S-A. You can't say that on YouTube because then you'll get in trouble. Uh, but she accused him of the worst things that a man can be accused of uh, other than murder. But I think they're probably pretty equal. And uh, I knew it didn't make sense. I knew it was ridiculous. He came out on his YouTube channel defending himself, saying that everything was not true and it's ridiculous and all of this, but he could only say so much because of the actual law being involved. Uh, the Dodgers immediately washed their hands of him, got rid of him. He was supposed to have a bobblehead night. They threw away all the bobbleheads, which just broke my heart. Um, and, and basically the Dodgers just, like I said, they just washed their hands of him. Um, and I, I really thought they did him wrong because he was never charged with anything. The, the, there was, of course, an investigation. The investigation found nothing. He was never charged with anything, yet because of an accusation, he was just basically thrown out of Major League Baseball and had to go and play in Japan. Now listen, Trevor Bauer is a very rich man. <laughs> very rich. He never has to work again it, ever in his life, but he had this life taken away from him, not because he was charged by Los Angeles County or because he went to jail or because he was going through a trial that might send him to jail. No, he was, he had his life ruined because of an accusation and that's absolutely wrong. And he finally was able to recently, uh, just the other day, be able to start talking publicly about this and showing evidence about it, about how this woman was basically bragging to her friends of what she was going to do to him, that she was going to get his $51 million and she was going to have him choke me out. That's how you get, that's how you get that bag. It, this is all documented and through text messages. 
It, the evidence is all out there, including a video that she took the day she was supposedly assaulted, excuse me, the morning after she was supposedly assaulted of her smiling and giggling, laying in bed with him while he's sleeping next to her. It's disgusting. This whole thing is disgusting. Even though Trevor Bauer is extraordinarily talented and he's very rich, and he's never going to worry about anything financially a day in his life, I feel so bad for him because he was at the top of the world and he had that taken away by a greedy broad. And that infuriates me. And what infuriates me more is the fact that the Dodgers washed their hands of him so fast, just from an accusation. I am one of those people that believes every accusation should be taken seriously, but to be just, just rid of somebody because of an accusation, that bothers me. I think the sad part is there are women out there that go through that and it's real. Right. And, it, and it's just a, it's a slap in their face. It's just horrible. Absolutely. And if Trevor Bauer did what that woman accused him of, I would say lock him up and throw away the key. Yeah. I am a hundred percent on board with that. There's no possible acceptable excuse for that. There's just, but, that's, you just don't. You don't lie about something like that. I mean, you're ruining so many lives. That's right. I mean, and it just, it really bothers me. Uh, I hope that girl goes to prison. I really do. Because this is going to keep happening to rich men. Well, yeah, she it, should. She should go to prison. Because like I said, yes, it's bad. It's horrible when a man is accused of something that he did not do. And you do hear a lot about that anymore you know i mean and some deserve it they deserve to get in trouble because they did do it but the the oh it just it really bothers me because there's just so many women out there that go through things and they don't speak up because they don't want to get you know mm -hmm. they don't want to look bad or, or or whatever and then you got someone that's just saying it and they're making it up because they want to make money and ruin someone's life i just yeah. Not only does it make it hard for women in the future, uh, or men for that matter, in the future, that that could they're they're going to be afraid to say anything. Yeah. Not only does it do that, but it also is like just throwing it in the face of women who already have gone through the right. real thing. Exactly. You're you're diminishing what they went through exactly. and shame on her for that. I think that woman is the she devil. She does deserve to go to jail. She should go to prison. Uh, Trevor Bauer should be one of the richest human beings on planet earth. Dude, you're not watching this, but if you are, first of all, I'm a big fan. Uh, I hope you never make another dollar for the MLB because of them, not you. I want you to be super rich. I hope you make all the money in Japan down there playing. I'm still watching your videos when you're talking about playing in Japan. I hope you clean up and become one of the richest people that's ever existed from suing the MLB for what they did to you and suing the Dodgers, one of the richest, if not the richest athletic organization on earth. I hope you own the goddamn Dodgers when all of this is said and done. That would make me the happiest person in the world because you know what? You should own them for what you what they did to you. And that broad that made all this happen, I hope she goes to prison and uh, makes cute little videos of herself smirking while she's in prison. That would make me very happy. <laughs> if you don't know what I'm talking about, B-A-U-E-R -E is how you spell his name. Trevor Bauer, look it up. Uh, it is one of the most depressing stories I've heard in a long time. And uh, even though he is very talented and will be rich for the rest of his life, I still feel bad for him because he didn't deserve what happened to him. So there you go. Hopefully, uh, hopefully you understand that I would hate him if what this woman said was true. I hope, that, I hope I'm very clear about that. But I hate her because of what she did and because none of it was true. Let's go to comment of the week. Let's do this all backwards. Okay. Okay, so for the five people that are still watching, um, <laughs> comment of the week is from the video, or it may have been a podcast. I don't even recall, but it was My Way or the Highway, Aquarium Snobs. Oh, boy. No, it's not bad. 
Oh. It's from Danielle Castaneda. And she says, opinions are like butts. Everyone has one. But the number one thing we can all agree on is betas are adorable anger nuggets. Indisputable <laughs> fact. Indisputable <laughs> fact. Just wanted to make sure I said it right. Because I can <laughs> stumble over my words sometimes. But yeah, I, I agree 100%. So... I really like that phrase. Opinions are like butts. Everyone has one. <laughs> well, since we are at the end of the podcast, it's usually said opinions are like assholes. Oh. Everybody's got one. But she decided to stay G-rated, and I appreciate that, oh. uh, and make it butts. Yeah, everybody's oh. got a butt just like everybody's got an opinion. That's, well, I like that, and that's why I brought it up. Not for you to say the bad word i know but uh, <laughs> you know me any opportunity i have to make myself look worse i'm gonna do it so well yeah. thank you guys so much for watching it's been a lot of fun and uh yeah it's been a great it's been fun talking about this these are the best kind of topics because we have so much experience in it and we can just roll we don't have to have an outline we just mm. see where it goes it's fun i hope you enjoy it as much as we enjoy making them and we will see you next week Bye.